Hello and welcome to Art Show. I'm Craig Stover and today I have with me Frank Heider. Hey Frank, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Pleasure I'm thrilled to, to have here. you on, on the show. Obviously, uh, I met you years and years ago, so it was wonderful to hear that you wanted to participate in this. So I'm eager to show some works of yours <laughs> that I found online. Um, of course, you have quite a bit of stuff online. And I just want to give the people a taste of what you do. Now, mm -hmm. this is a little deceptive, this first piece, because it looks like it's a little bit small, but I know that this is a large piece, right? Right. Yes. So sometimes, and in particular, this is not a, just a flat painting. This is no. done with strips of wood that you've carved out and reused. Right. right. Okay. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, this is a giant series that you've done with these faces. Yes. Tell right. me about what, what started this with these faces. Okay. Um, faces have been part of my work since I was about 10 years old. Mm. Okay. Uh, I, I, I learned I, as a child, I, I wanted to make art and I was making art and I found art an artist to sort of advise me. And, and that guy made woodcuts. He wrote the speedball textbooks actually, mm -hmm. and uh, was the pioneer in uh, developing water, water soluble inks for schools, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to a, a guy who painted portraits, who invited me to join a life drawing group when I was 12 years old. And I sat alongside of, Frieda Ryder, who mm -hmm. was during the Watergate hearings, became a national figure because she was the official artist for the mm -hmm. Watergate hearings. So every day, everyone in the United States knew who Frieda Ryder was. So that's how far back my images uh, with interest in heads had been. My first show in Baltimore in 1970 as an art student were big head portraits done in oil pastel. Uh, so I have a long history. Anyway, uh, after studying painting with Alex Katz and Neil Welliver, uh, I was really indoctrinated in the New York, New mm. England School of Painting, uh, Fairfield Porter, mm. uh, all of that uh, identification. And my work began to evolve and move away from some of those things as I saw some of the German expressionist painters uh, who were my age group, who were starting to come to, you know, Italians and Germans, mm -hmm. European guys who were really interested in meaning and art. Whereas the New England school of painting was using the figure, but playing down the meaning, et cetera. You mm -hmm. know, much more focus on uh, how a painting was made than why a painting was made. Right. Anyway, this investigation into European work led me to a discovery of an artist that I had never heard of, whose name was Klaus Sluter. Mm -hmm. And he was a, he's roughly, you could call him Belgian, you can call him German, you can call mm -hmm. him French. Anyway, he, he made figurative art that looked like an abstraction from a distance. Mm -hmm. And when he got close, they had these beautifully rendered faces and hands. And he lived... 75 years before Donatello. Hmm. And I could see these figures, which were called pleurants, hmm. which in French means the morning ones. Mm -hmm. And they fascinated me. And so what I did was I sort of took this idea of something changing when you got close to it from something stepping away from it. And I did these big heads. This particular painting is eight by eight. Right. Um, but it really needs to be seen in person because of the yeah. textures and the details. Thank you. But when I, it, I, it, I it opened, yes, it opens up to eight by 16 feet, right. which is another thing that comes from my interest in those German artists, which was uh, Peter Bruegel and the notion of interior and exterior paintings. And, and then, of course, you know, I was impressed by Kiefer's use of the landscape as a kind of uh, a setting. Mm -hmm. For a story that was not about another sunny day in, 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 right. in uh, <laughs> you know, and was basically about something else. Well, and so I, I, that's how I got there to start with. Go ahead. Okay. Before we go on to the next piece, I just have one quick question about this. 
just yeah. to satisfy my own curiosity. I noticed that a number of them, not all of them, but a number of them, the figures have closed eyes. Yes. Right. So is there a specific meaning behind that? And, yeah, I want that to be, uh, I, they're going, they're closing their eyes because they're reflecting. They are looking inward. Mm. And as many of those paintings opened up, Physically, you actually had to open them to see what was. It's as right. if when you opened them, you could see what they could see with their eyes closed. You know, are all um, the ones that open have closed eyes? Uh, yeah, really. But, oh, that's a great thing. Now I got to go back and start relooking at some yes, of these pieces. They, uh, but so not this, everyone with those do not open. <laughs> okay. Right, right. But I thought it was right. important to show just how varied and really exciting this Faces series is. I mean, you could just, yeah. you, you could keep on going. So I understand the the stripe pattern, especially from the Janus series, but right. this other sort of camouflaging right. or, or like, a, it's almost like a pop camouflage. Th this photograph was taken in my studio in San Diego de los Altos in Venezuela, okay. where I lived for a year at 6,500 feet above sea level in a <laughs> cloud forest. Uh -huh. And this studio is, to this day, the single greatest studio I was ever in. <laughs> um, it, it is enormous. Uh -huh. It was at least 48 by 60 feet. Yeah. There was no columns in the building. And the ceiling was 38 feet high with glass windows at the top. So the, wow. the light quality in the room, you never needed to turn on a light. If you took a photograph, the, the, the exposure was perfect. I mean, it was spectacular. So and, when you uh, first got into this space, yes, did you notice that, you, did your work explode? Did you notice like freedom? Well, the first thing I noticed was how big it was. And I actually said to my wife, I said, this space is so intimidating. I don't know, it's overwhelming. Uh -huh. And I had gone to Venezuela and deliberately chosen this place because I wanted to break. I, I had gotten to be known as the guy who made these big heads out of wood and right. all my paintings were made out of wood. Right. And I said, I want to shed that, 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 you know, that uh, pigeonhole. Right. And the, what I wanted to do was make things out of paper. So all okay. those paintings were on handmade paper that I made in that room nice. and, and that camouflaging uh -huh. every day I would walk from the top of the mountain into the village below, which after eight months, my physical condition was like uh, amazing, right? Yeah. I, I would pass by these little houses and people would make fences out of steel that had come from factories where they had stamped out engine parts or something. So they had these weird shaped holes in them. And I just found <laughs> passing by these things. I said, that's the most interesting kind yeah. of, 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 of an enigma. It, it was never meant to be a fence, right. but it is a fence. And I could see through the fence in a way that I have never seen through a fence. So I began to borrow that affect. And that's how we got to that point. That is, so. a, that is the most artistic thing you could have said today about finding <laughs> something and then finding a way to put it into your work. So yeah. you mentioned that you, you know, you, you don't do just these large paintings. And I right. really wanted to show, I thought this was a great example of these inflatables that you do. When did you right. start these? Were these, were these in like the mid nineties when I started seeing them? No, the, uh, what happened was in, uh, my work was becoming in the mid nineties and late nineties was incredibly more sculptural. Mm. And the paintings referred to objects almost in a volumetric way and far less uh, painterly and far more sort of plastic. And while I was living in the rainforest, uh, I just be slowly was evolving into a sculptor of sorts. And mm. I would begin sort of building very crude structures using bamboo and available elements. And uh, I did... A, I. I got the opportunity to do some installations with those pieces in community museums and things like that in South America. And then I began to discover how critical light could be to those forms. Hmm. And my first choice was to shine light on things and through things, because that was very close to the experience I was having living in a rainforest 
you could hmm. never see the sky. You could only see the light moving through the things, you know. Uh -huh. And then um, I, I became, you know, it, it, it took on more and more presence. The inflatables didn't really begin until 2008. I was oh, okay. invited to make an inflatable and be part of a group of artists. In uh, uh, They were almost all Cuban artists. Uh, they invited me to participate in a group called Giants in the City. Hmm. And so all of my early inflatables were somewhere between 20 and 30 feet tall. Hmm. And every time I made one, I learned more and saw more that I could do with them. Now, mm -hmm. everybody I was talking about these ideas with, Everybody thought this was a really bad, a bad avenue to go into, <laughs> you know, because what can you do with things like this? Oh, and, no, uh, Don't, I'm so, glad you didn't listen to them. Well, there's many of them still have that opinion. So yeah. I can't, you know, I, I just I learned a long time ago that when I come to an idea, uh, it's and then I spend time with it and, and do some research into my own thoughts and then in mm -hmm. you know, like in other references in the history of art. Um, I, once I've crossed that bridge, I don't need to look back. I'm going to go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> now, now we're into the pandemic. Okay. Okay. That's and when this, is. so I love the, the idea that you're, you're combining, you know, the, the inflatables, painting, mm -hmm. these heads, these, in, but then you've got this whole other storyline. Right. That you've put them all well, in that, boats. Right. Well, that and again, you're absolutely on the heart of the matter. There's always a storyline. I'm always trying to connect the unconnectable. Mm -hmm. In other words, I look at A and D and make C, mm -hmm. all right? And so uh, they're not obvious connections. Uh, when I made the inflatables in the beginning, I was just following the inflatables. Mm -hmm. Then in... Uh, 2012 or 13, I was invited by Fabergé through my dealer in New York at the time and London mm -hmm. to participate in a show that Fabergé was organizing called the Fabergé Big Egg Hunt New York. Mm -hmm. So they sent me and 260 other artists, including Jeff Koons, Julian mm -hmm. Schnabel, David Sally, all these really famous people. They sent us all the same big eggs. We hmm. could do whatever we wanted with it. Well, yeah. I I made my egg. I sent it to New York, and it was well received, and uh, it got a lot of attention. And I said, you know, there's something in that egg shape that I have mm -hmm. to pay attention mm -hmm. to. <laughs> so I began to think about that shape, mm -hmm. uh, and then I was um, because I was making these inflatables. Uh, I made, a, a, you know, I had made these inflatables, and I I had gotten this kind of strange gig. Uh, I was I had sold some paintings to a luxury cruise line and the guy who was the founder of the cruise line really liked artists and he liked art and he hmm. knew more about art than I was really surprised at what he knew. And he was a Cuban guy, but he was absolutely crazy about artists and he was buying art from artists, I, you know, local artists here in Miami and using us in his ships. Hmm. So. And he, he would come to my studio. He's a guy, I would see him on CNBC with Kramer. And then he'd be in my studio talking to me about painting, which I think <laughs> this is this is an interesting person. Yeah. So anyway, he he convinced me to go onto his ship. He built a, two ships that had studios for artists. Uh -huh. And he said, you can do what you want in the room and people can come in and talk to you. And uh, and you can uh, sell them paintings if you, or objects if you want. So is that where the ship, this, these boats came yeah. from, from being yes. on the ship? So so when I could made it this, so when I I did this thing, and he he sent me to Polynesia, mm -hmm. and I got on a ship in Polynesia, and I stayed in Polynesia for thirty days, and the ship sort of sailed around, and every eight days or something, a new group of people would get on the ship mm -hmm. and come visit. Mm -hmm. And I was, all these people, I don't know, I didn't know anything about cruise ships. I don't know anything about people doing cruises. But all these people kept talking to me about how Obama had divided the country and he had created this race problem that, that and I'm looking at these people and I, what are you talking about? Right. And, 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 but I, but they, it was a, a, a strong thread 
that mm. kept coming through. And so when I left Polynesia after my 30 day sentence, um, I, I took a boat across the Pacific to Lima, Peru, mm -hmm. and we stopped at Easter Island. Mm -hmm. And I was on Easter Island and I'm walking around and I said, you know, I have this idea. I could put my egg, my inflatable together with these heads mm -hmm. and come up with something. So I created these uh, inflatable, the first of these Janus figures, which I called them based on the fact they have two faces. Yeah. Um, the, I created the first of them. And when I shared, I was ecstatic about the form because yeah. it was the first time the inflatables actually got to where I wanted them. You in took my them to the next to level. Yeah. Right. It's quite and extraordinary. then Alan Edmonds in Philadelphia at Brandywine saw a picture of it. I shared a picture of him. And he said, Would, could you bring this to Philadelphia? And mm -hmm. I did. And he, I brought it to Brandywine and we put it out on Broad Street. And at the same time, this person at the at the cruise line saw the picture and said, could you take that on a ship? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. Mm -hmm. So I worked out, I came up with my own idea, which was, I called the Janus Project. Mm -hmm. I think these heads are about unity. In mm -hmm. other words, they're an egg shape, they mm -hmm. have two faces, and they're different colors. Every one, mm -hmm. they're always different. So it says, no matter what color you think you are, no matter what shape you think you are, no matter how you disguise your face, mm -hmm. we all come from one yeah. race, the human yeah. race, one egg. No bullshit. This is right. just fact, all right? And it was a personal statement for myself. But now I had the opportunity to take it out in public. So I put together three months where they put me on these ships in Europe, and they would take me to places. And I would drag these things out and set them up in public <laughs> without permits. I had tons of fun with the police and other things. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I'd go, I'd explain what they meant. And everywhere I went, people said, yeah, that makes sense. That makes but sense, I couldn't right. get any attention. Yeah. And nobody in, nobody in Philadelphia, nobody in Miami was interested in what I was doing. Because it wasn't angry enough. It wasn't angry. Right, it wasn't, yeah, right. It wasn't, I wasn't throwing rocks in the faces of people. I was saying, hey, think about this, people. Right. So anyway, then uh, during that time, you know, I had been taking this thing, this message around. And uh, during that time, I had, had, had been hit by a car here in Miami and broke both of my legs. Jeez. And I was in a wheelchair. And so... I couldn't, I I couldn't do the setups. Right. So what I did was I I went to the places in a wheelchair, and I would make sketches, and then I would go back and I began to create watercolors and paintings mm. of these different things that were were you know mm. what I wanted to do but I couldn't do, mm. and then during the pandemic, uh, I began to make these kinds of paintings where the Janices are sailing around the world looking for destinations uh, and there are none it's right. just the world in well this, as soon as you void. said as soon as you said pandemic i started right. thinking about the fact that um you know it's weird because i started doing boats too uh mm -hmm. but the fact that there's like these pods of people that's exactly what we had with everybody was right. shut in and so that's right. it, it makes that 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 perfect connection um, and and that was exactly what i was thinking <laughs> perfect so I, I want to uh, ask you, I got a couple of questions here for you. Um, yeah. I, I'm curious, this is a question I ask a lot of artists. Uh, when you first started, when you were a very young child, did you ever have a, a moment where like a first exposure to art that just really stuck with you and maybe yes. changed you? What was it? Uh, I went to, as a little kid, about five years old, I went to the Philadelphia Museum uh -huh. where I saw Peter Paul Rubens' Prometheus Bound. Nice. And okay. I was knocked out. Yeah. And, and for the rest of my life, that moment will never leave. Yeah. Seeing uh, that painting for me incorporated everything that art had to be. It uh -huh. had to have meaning. Yep. It, it, could, it could have nudity. It could have animals. It had to have nature. It had to have, you know, drive. Yeah. And I, I absolutely was head over heels over this has to be. And as a result, through all the time I was in school, I resisted abstraction, mm -hmm. uh, even though, you know, I studied with people who knew, knew more about abstraction than, in, you know, than I could imagine. Right. All the conversations were always about the abstract qualities in the paintings. 
But at the same time, I've always kind of believed that meaning mattered. And uh, and that comes from that, that, you know, really small child experience of seeing yeah. that painting. And uh, it's still just it still moves me every time. I, I see totally it. agree with you. That storyline, you know, mythology was always a, fa a fascination of mine anyway. That storyline, that I could look at that painting like every day for the next, you know, decade and still find something new within it. So right. I, I totally get you. I, I want to talk a little bit about your creative process. Um, first question is, is you keep a sketchbook? I have lots of them. Oh, and, you do? Uh, okay. And, and, and uh, I, do, uh, I do ideas and imaginary thoughts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I draw sometimes from nature. I draw sometimes completely out of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, uh, I have lots and lots of these little books that I've kept over the years that uh, I, I don't think of them as drawings that I would share with people. They're, mm -hmm. they're my, mm -hmm. it's my private notes, but yes, I do. It's like a language now, of your own. Yes. And now I do a lot of really small watercolors, like eight by 10 inch watercolors. And uh, they really are my, my thinking arena, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I'm a great believer in sketchbooks. So uh, I, I also am curious to know about the, your creative process you know, obviously, from when you first started to now, it's, you know, you've had changes over over time period. Right. Have right. those changes always been gradual, like one change leads to another, another? Or have you ever gotten to a point where suddenly you've made radical changes? I've made radical changes many times. Okay. And to the point where uh, one of the reasons that I, you know, I get lose galleries is because I refuse to stick to the script. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I had, look, I've had more good fortune than a lot of artists in the sense that I've had a lot of galleries and mm -hmm. some of them are pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm still, I, right now I, I, I work with Ethan Cohen in New York, who's like one of the great dealers in the world, mm -hmm. but they're all the same. I, I hate to say something like this. They all <laughs> are looking for a saleable product uh -huh. and they want to be able to explain to everyone, this is who you are. Right. This is what the he right. does. Right? Right. This is what she does is. And, um, you know, stubbornly, I, I kind of want to be free, you know, from that. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> my first show in New York uh, got me in, got me an interview at Marlboro Gallery mm -hmm. and got me included in a group show at Frumpkin Gallery. Uh, which was a pretty nice, and I refused to make work that looked like that for my right. next show. All right, so that shows you I'm not very bright. <laughs> <laughs> so you have lots of different series of works. Right. My first question about that is: is do the series overlap? Are you ever working on multiple series at oh, the same time? Well, yes. The time, right. I, I had a really wonderful conversation with an artist in Philadelphia by the name of Peter Payone oh, a few Peter, years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I really had never spoken to him, but I had known his work for many years. Mm -hmm. But we sat and talked for about five hours. He invited me to visit him, and we mm. sat and talked. I, I thought we were going to have a cup of coffee, and it turns into a, a marathon. Yeah, that happened. But, <laughs> and he, he, was really, he really helped me understand that our notions of time and our notions of our work are very heavily influenced by yeah. the world outside. The real reality is that when you look back on an artist's work in their after they're long gone, mm -hmm. that none of that matters. None of that matters. No. It and and so it's all your work or my work or their work. Yeah. And how you do it and how you enter it and how you leave it, that's totally up to you. So I hear this all the time from artists who are always trying to show me their newest work, and they're always surprised when I say, "I don't really care about the newest work. I want to look at." Your entire body. I want to see you as a as a, as a full artist. Right. So, actually, speaking of of the entire body, one last question about series: yeah. Have you ever retired a series? Have you ever said, "All right, I'm done"? Or do you always? Uh, well, I did retire the Florence for a while. I was okay. like, I, I, they look. They took me, they took me really far, and they uh -huh. got me an awful lot of access that I would not have mm -hmm. gotten. But again, I resisted the pigeonholing. And and then there are these people that no matter what you're doing, mm -hmm. they're always saying, well, I wish you were doing this. Or yeah, well, I wonder whether what, you, you know, and, <laughs> you know, I, I also, you know, also it's kind of fun. You'd have an artist come visit you in the studio 
and they start talking about what they would do. Uh huh. Right. Not, it's like, hey, I'm not doing what you're doing. That's why right. I'm doing it here, not at your house, right? <laughs> you never want to do the the sorry thing. So we've got time for just two more questions. Sure. My first one is: is do you consider your works to be autobiographical in any nature, or are you trying to make them separate? No, I think that you cannot separate the artist from their work. Okay. I mean, I can't look at a Picasso painting without seeing him, mm -hmm. even when he paints a woman. Right. Uh, you know, I, you know, and uh, uh, I, and I, I think I'm visible in, in, in pretty much whatever I do. Okay. And, and again, you know, again, pigeonholing people want to look at things and say, oh, that's commercial and that's not nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't make something thinking mm -hmm. about what this is the fact. I make something because I want to see what it looks like. I have no idea how it's going to turn out. Even mm -hmm. if I've made a million paintings or a thousand paintings, it doesn't matter. Right. Everyone is a fresh opportunity to go in a new direction. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, Phil Augustine once said, you know, every artist works 10 hours a day in the studio in search of 20 minutes of inspiration. <laughs> and, and, and that's the value of the day. You yeah. know, it's like that little clue, that yeah. thing that makes you want to come back the next day and see where it's going to go. So so speaking of of being in the studio and making work. Question I ask all artists, what does making art do for you? Uh, I, I I don't know how to live without it. I mean, I make art every day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 I used to marvel at artists who could like do special project art or could separate. You know, when I used to teach, I would come home from my studio. At first, when they hired me, they invited me. to. I wasn't looking for a job. They invited right. me. And and then I said, I'll only do it if I can only I, I have to work a full schedule in two days. I'll mm -hmm. work double shifts. But mm -hmm. I can't, I'm not giving up my other time. And for 16 years, they let me get away with that. And <laughs> I would come back. And I literally would go run out the front door of my studio on 2nd Street on yeah. my bicycle. And uh -huh. I had 20 minutes to get to the school. And I would go into the room, brow covered with sweat to start the room. And I got out that door and I went right, right back to the studio <laughs> at the end of the day. And that story I, says everything. I refuse to stop doing that that way. <laughs> well, Frank, I, I really want to thank you for coming by and talking with me today. Boy, that half hour went super quick when the conversation is so interesting. I want to thank you for stopping by. And I also want to thank everybody who watched today's episode of Art Show. We really enjoy your support. Of course, we love it. If you like, share, and most important, subscribe. That really helps push Art Show out so more people get to see it. So thank you for watching. And again, Frank, always a pleasure. My pleasure. Take care.